Thank you, Alison. Thank you to the Asia Society for having us here. It's been a pleasure to work with the team and, of course, um, uh, Civic Exchange for hosting me all these weeks, and uh, uh, which is my home away from home, and CDP, which hosts me the rest of the time at home, my home at home. And um, thank you all for coming. I know you have uh, a lot of competition for your time, and you could be elsewhere tonight. So I'm very appreciative that you chose to be here with us. And um, I'm just going to set the stage a little bit briefly, and then we'll have our panel discussion. So I just wanted to begin with this, which um, some of you have met, many of you have seen before, either with me or in uh, all kinds of other locations. But you know, it's an art object in itself. And um, obviously, it's the view of the Earth seen from space. And this very thin, whoops, so sensitive, this very thin wafer, you know, I mean, an artist could have made that. And um, to me, this is a cultural icon now, this picture. And the, the one that we know more is the one of the whole planet. But the one that really re I relate to is this one because of this little, uh, I don't know how you would call it, lining, or uh, if you went like this right now with your face, you have fuzz on your face, and it connects to your cheek, and your cheek connects to your, the rest of your body. Well, the relationship of the fuzz on your face to your body is the same relationship that this wafer is in to the rest of the planet. So it's a kind of cosmic um, magnificence, but the whole story of climate change, everything that uh, vexes us and that we have to deal with, is captured in this space. Um, what I call the cosmic penthouse, the infinitely rare space in which our survival luxuriates. If this layer were not there, we would burn to death because of ultraviolet light, as you all know. The atmospheric area is exceedingly scarce in the same relationship, as I said, to the hair on your face. And normally, culturally, we value highly that which is scarce. And almost in every language, there is the expression, what is scarce is precious. I want to thank Joyce Lau, who corrected my Chinese. And if I'm sure there's somebody else who's going to find other uh, uh, calligra calligraphic um, changes. But I, I just love the way these expressions look in the Asian languages, in, in addition to what, what they mean. Because what is scarce is precious. And that is the point. And this, for example, we can behold this, a beautiful nautilus shell, and treat it preciously, even though we probably can find it for free on a beach. We value it, even though it might have been without cost, because it's perfect. And because it speaks to us in some sort of, whether you want to call it spiritual level or aesthetic level, but it's a cultural response that we're having to this particular item, which is so perfect and so beautiful. And it will always be very inexpensive. It'll either be free on the beach, or maybe you get a little extra price if you buy it in a shop. But its value to you in its beauty will never be able to be priced by you. And of course, children. None of us would say that we value them at the level that it costs us to raise them. I don't have any, but I hear all about the costs of food, and the costs of college, and the costs of health, and the costs of housing, and they want to live with you, and then they can't move out. It's expensive to have children. <laughs> but you would never say that the value of your children is equal to the amount you spend on them. Yet, as scarce as this atmosphere is, as scarce as it is, as rare and as precious as it is, we value it at nothing. And when you think about the current economic situation that we're in, where we value in the billions of dollars companies like Uber and Alibaba, and um, Tencent, well, maybe not Tencent, but these companies that are nothing but software and pixels. And their whole value proposition is intangible. And on top of that, they provide convenient services, which none of which are necessary, actually. We value those companies. Our economy has found a way to value those in the billions and billions of dollars. And this atmosphere, which you cannot replicate, which is unique, we value at zero. So I find this a cultural paradox. I don't find it necessarily an economic problem. Somehow, tonight's discussion, I hope, will explore how we came to inhabit, accept, and even normalize this contradiction, and how various sectors of our economy, or rather of our society, in particular the arts and finance, are in fact reacting and resisting this pressure to fall into this dichotomy. So what is culture? 
Uh, is it the whole or is it the parts? Is it a collection of tangible artifacts to be one day discovered by archaeologists who use their findings to interpret the customs and habits of societies? Or is it the infinitely diverse pursuits and behaviors that collectively encompass the intangible aspects of our lives and express what we most value and why? So what is the climate change problem? Let me just give a short review. I know many people in here do, do already know, but, you know, when you think about economic growth, the, the whole economic growth story has been essentially the titanic effort to take what was minding its own business under the ground since the time of the dinosaurs or before, namely fossil fuels, and dig them out, extract them, burn them up, and put them up here. And now that's where they are. So our whole progress has been moving these subterranean things to become atmospheric things. But the problem is those gases, the six greenhouse gases, are collecting up here. They get trapped in this thin, thin, thin atmospheric wafer, and the sun comes in, heats it up, and stays there. And so, the, you know, you think about the weather as sort of being everywhere in outer space. The weather is created in this little layer of air. So it's just like a carousel. The clouds keep going around. <laughs> And the tighter it gets, the less room they have because the gases take up all the space, the clouds collide. And this is why we have extreme rain and extreme droughts. There's no room for the weather, essentially, anymore in this wafer. And that's what climate change is, weather without room. And it's very hard to picture it that way, but that is the case. It's a physics problem. And the good news is because it's a physics problem, what goes up you know, what goes up must come down. <laughs> and that's the story. We have to stop treating this cosmic penthouse like a laundry room. And the reason we've been doing it is because it's been free to us. And because somehow our culture is not valuing it. So the task before us is very simple in a way. It's a mathematical challenge, a physics, physics challenge, is to remove ton by ton the atmospheric uh, greenhouse gases and cease to putting, putting them up there at uh, the rate in which we are now, or at least never, ever putting a ton up there that could be avoided, that could somehow not be put up there. And the analogy many of you have heard me say is like, it's like renting the Mandarin Oriental penthouse and then putting the dirty laundry in there. And on top of it, we're not even paying for the penthouse. So if you're gonna rent the Mandarin Oriental penthouse, it's certainly not for your dirty laundry. And that's the parallel with the atmosphere. So it's not a simple matter of pollution where you can just extract the single poison we have let get out of control, but it's a result of what has become our mainstream behavior, a byproduct of our use of energy over the last half century, the very means by which modern society became modern. The means through which we, are create, we have created progress, the medium for all our successes, the medium for all our failures, and therefore climate change is an indelible reflection of who we are and inseparable from our decisions. This is why climate change is so difficult to address, because to address it requires a complete shift in our priorities and emphasis, and how we choose our priorities is also a cultural matter. The complexity of the climate change problem still tends to surprise us and certainly daunt us. And an artwork that brought home the cultural aspects to me is the extraordinary, this extraordinary piece, View of Tide, by Yang Lianglian, um, whose work at first glance captures the tranquility of a classical Asian landscape. And on closer view, I mean, just take a minute to look at this. And this isn't even the whole piece. I saw his work for the first time at the Metropolitan Museum in a show called Ink. And I looked at it from a distance and I thought, wow, that's a really beautiful classical Chinese painting. And when you get closer and closer, you see what is here. These are all derricks and um, even the mountains are oil rigs and, and, and various forms of cultural detritus that actually do sort of resemble the landscape. And so you go from thinking that you're looking at a landscape that's natural to one that is unnatural. And it is almost what you, the, 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 for me anyway, the, the change in the panorama was a so subtle, it almost was indistinguishable from what I had first seen in my mind's eye, which was that natural landscape. I was projecting them both. And this to me is how climate change has overtaken us with the same subtlety and surprise. So we tend to think of culture as mainly a, an artistic arena 
And surely artists do project and capture cultural values and the work of artists touches our imagination and illuminates aspects of our culture that perhaps otherwise remain unseen and examined. But climate change is, is, has got other, other dimensions as well which touch finance. And to the extent that culture is an expression of what we value, disruption of our financial world is also essential. Finance needs a vanguard too. Just the way we have vanguard artists, finance needs vanguard people too. And finance also needs new norms and models because to address climate change, we need to use and deeply depo and deploy money differently. We need capital to accomplish the reinvention required. Because when you think about it, we need to reinvent, remake, rehab, redraw, replan, redesign, re-inhabit, redo just about everything our habits, our buildings, our processes, our products. It's a fantastic, extraordinary opportunity. And it's a way to, it, it touches our imagination at the core. And as someone said the other day, I think it was Henny Sender at uh, uh, an event that uh, we put on with uh, Hong Kong University, failure to do so is a failure of imagination. So we need artists to have imagination to sort of project us forward, but we equally need you know, people who manage money and know something about money to also change the way we view money. And in fact, it's not outlandish to say that um, the, uh, the task in, ter in terms of the financial world is to figure out a way to make tangible, intangible value, to take what is non-financial information, like environmental health, and translate it so that it's legible and, and readable as financial information, which is a, a, a revolution, dare I say. I wouldn't be the first to say there has to be a revolution in the way money is managed. There's another question, which is, of course, business has to make money. So green investment has really been th thought of as uh, sacrificial, as a charity operation. And increasingly, that's not so. But then you get into the question of returns. W how much return? How much should people be looking at? Who's to say? Wh what's enough? Those are also cultural questions. Who's going to decide that? What's going to be the norm for what's enough? And I think that's an essential question too that goes to the cultural heart of, of, of tonight. And in fact, I wouldn't be going on a limb if I said that I thought climate change demands us to ask, what is the very purpose of wealth? So these are the issues we hope to explore tonight with our panel. Now, to my knowledge, uh, none of the panelists have ever had met before uh, tonight. So I hope they get along. But uh, they are each engaged at the highest levels of their professions, bumping into climate change in different ways. They will speak a bit about their personal view of the problem and how climate change expresses itself in the concerns uh, of their work. And they are all explorers and discoverers in their individual ways. You've seen their bio notes in the program, but I'll just say a few things before um, we begin. Pa uh, Polani Mohan, who will lead off, is a photographer who travels the globe and encounters the visual and cultural impacts of climate change among remote people and places. And he's going to speak a bit to uh, several of his recent journeys with a few of his photographs, which I think, um, as they say, a picture is worth a thousand words and probably all the words I've just said. Um, Annie Chen is the founder of the RS Group, which is a family office that has undertaken an extensive review of its investment patterns and portfolio to align with environmental and social objectives. Pearl Lam leads the art world in presenting vanguard and established work, who is deeply sensitive herself to environmental issues and the unique role artists and designers are playing. And Michael McLeod, who is a leader in the world of music and the performing arts, commissions and presents works that directly and indirectly are and inspire our relationship to nature and cultural balance. So this is the uh, scene we're trying to explore tonight. And I'm going to invite uh, Palani to come up and just kick things off for us and tell us a little bit about what he's been up to lately and how he re most recently bumped into climate change. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I just have to figure out how to work this. So I'm going to go forward one more. That's it. So um, what's a good photograph? Um, I've been asked that many times, and everyone's got their own version of what a good photograph is. And to me, it's a very simple thing. A good photograph is an image that moves your soul, that makes you stop and makes you think and makes you act. Um, ever since uh, someone told me that uh, very long ago when I was working for a newspaper in Australia. And as I'm getting old, 
older, I go to places like Mongolia to photograph, to do portraits, and I end up doing something completely different. I start photographing clouds, and I start photographing cracks on frozen lakes. I don't know why I'm doing it. I felt com compelled to do so. So, Paula has given you this wonderful image of the big picture, and I'm here to do something completely different. I want to give you a couple of examples of people that I've met in Mongolia who talk about climate change. They have no idea what climate change is, never heard of it, probably, you know, wouldn't normally talk about it, but they talk about it in different ways. So I'll start off by the latest trip to Mongolia I just made, which was I'm working on another book project about the Mongolian horse, and not only the Mongolian horse, but the, the herders that take care of their horses, and what place they have in Mongolian society. So the images. Um, are of beautiful mountains, massive clouds, frozen lakes. That's what I'm trying to do. But what I'm finding when I'm going there and talking to the people is that they're talking about different things. That they think the lakes, the, I, and, I, and I look at a lake and I say, God, that is so beautiful. And they say, oh, it used to be a lot more beautiful before because the winters are getting a lot shorter. The lakes are, are, are warming up and things are, there is great change taking place. So over the next couple of years, when I go off and do this book, I'm going, to, I'm going to focus on the smaller things that are making big changes in Mongolia. So this is the image um, on an ice shelf that I took. I went to photograph horses. <laughs> And, I'm, and I just realized that the horses and these images are, are, will beautifully sink in together. So, um, now I'd like to very briefly move on to a, a project that I did about five years ago uh, to the very, very northwest part of Mongolia. So if you can imagine in a map where Kazakhstan, China, Russia, and Mongolia meet. That's where I went, in the Altai Mountains. And I went there to document the last 50 to 60 men who hunt with golden eagles of uh, wolves and foxes. That's where I went. And I started the project in 2012, and I spent five years in Mongolia. And one of the times, the first time I went to Mongolia in 2012, I met a very important man who would change me forever. So, this, this man's name is Orak Khan. He sadly has passed away a couple of years ago. So, Orak Khan is tall, he's handsome, he's got blind in one eye, and his hands are like sandpaper. Now, Orak Khan is the greatest of all the eagle hunters in the land, a living legend. His wife passed away about a decade ago, and he's full of stories that no one wants to listen to, but I did. So every time I went back to Mongolia, I, f I would go out of my way to find him, and I would try to spend as much time as I could with him. He thought I was completely eccentric. He used to say, you know, why do you leave your family year after year and return to the coal to ask me more of the same questions? <laughs> and he told me so much about the wolves and the foxes and the food and their culture. But most importantly, he told me about the environment. He used to say things like, something's going on out there. I don't quite get it. Go out there, the, the rivers, they used to be a lot higher. The lakes, they used to be, stay frozen for a lot, more, a lot longer. There's great change happening over there. I have no idea why, but something is not right. Now, it is a very sobering thing for me, sitting there listening to this old great man, and he is talking about climate change. He's never heard of it. And I used to tell him, you know, where I come from in the West, there are great men and women who believe the same thing as you. They're great wise men. And he would stop me and he would tell me that he doesn't need to listen to any wise men. 
just go outside and have a look. So this used to be only a couple of years ago. This is me taking a photograph, by the way, in, in minus 40 degrees. That's one thing I forgot to tell you that, I mean, I was born in Madras in South India, right? <laughs> I'm not built for the cold at all. And the only time to go to these places are really, not the only time, but the time that I, most of the time I choose to go to these places are <laughs> minus 40 degrees. So, the, so that's me take, trying to take a photograph. And that only a couple of years ago used to be a glacier. And that's gone now. So there are great changes happening in Mongolia. And once again, it's very sobering to listen to old men who have never left the valley all their lives, and they can see that change happening in front of them. And um, I'll talk more about Ora Khan in my panel, but um, I just wanted to kick things off by showing you some photographs. Thank you. Um, so moving from, from uh, ICE uh, and Mongolians um, and the problems, it's, uh, I first thought, how, how are we going to segue into uh, our S group from, from Mongolia? But I, I think I know how, which is um, that uh, you know, there are people working sort of indirectly on behalf of the people that uh, um, uh, uh, Polanyi photographed, and Annie, Annie Chen is really a visionary uh, in, in this field of so-called environmental <laughs> investing, green finance, impact investing. So, Annie, my first question to you is, how did you, you're, you're on a journey too, uh, it isn't necessarily to Mongolia, but, but how did your journey to move your family office uh, ahead uh, evolve, and where are you in it at this point? Um, I'm trying to condense, you know, what was um, a, a 10 year journey into like maybe five minutes. Um, so I have to kind of rewind things back to about 10 years ago. Um, uh, prior to that, I'm a lawyer by training, so um, I'm not even from the investment world as such, um, which uh, may have turned out to be a good thing. Uh, but anyway, um, so I was a lawyer first and then I was involved with um, 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 working with my siblings to build out our um, family office that my parents created. Uh, and then about a decade ago, um, we had um, a, um, I shall call it a disaggregation. And so I, I basically had to take uh, responsibility for, for my share of, um, of assets that, that uh, our parents had gifted us. And having spent the prior decade kind of working uh, in a family office and um, uh, dealing with, um, you know, the, the, the central issue of, you know, how do you uh, invest, how do you, uh, for the purpose of preserving wealth. Um, uh, I had gone to a, a point where um, I was really trying to find additional meaning in that other than just fulfilling a responsibility uh, uh, to, um, to my parents uh, as creators of the wealth. Um, and, um, but around that same time, you know, a number of other things kind of happened to create kind of the perfect storm. Um, so I mentioned the um, um, the actual inheritance, you know, um, uh, uh, having to take responsibility of, of um, certain pool of assets. Um, uh, some of you uh, will remember the financial crisis also happened in 2008. Um, and around the same time, I was also doing just a lot more reading uh, up on uh, climate change. Um, I couldn't help but notice, you know, reading the newspapers um, every day that more and more you see reports around um, extreme weather events, people um, becoming more concerned about climate change, um, the specter of um, there being climate refugees. Um, and, you know, once you start thinking about the reason why these things were happening, um, but if you allow yourself to think about it, you know, pretty soon it actually traces back to ourselves and the lifestyle that we're having and the things that we do for a living and the way that we invest. Um, and so all of these things kind of came together, as I said, as I said to, to form the perfect storm. And I, I, I just had to do something about it. Um, and the easiest way uh, for me was to um, change the way uh, that I invest. Um, and to make a long story short, I spent some time transitioning um, my investments from fairly traditional um, things to uh, uh, 
all sustainable investments. Um, I had also discovered impact investing along the way and um, realized that there's really uh, n nothing that says that you have to keep charity or philanthropy separate from the way that you invest. Um, these are all acts involving the use of resources, financial resources, uh, most of the time. And they all have, they all bring their, um, uh, their own sets of um, uh, uh, value creation or discreation, I suppose, um, you know, if it's, if it's not a good thing, um, and consequences. It's just that we, we choose to track the return, if you will, or the performance of, you know, how we do charity or philanthropy and how we do investments differently. Uh, for investments, you know, we're looking to, you know, everybody looks to maximize returns and you do so unquestionably. But, you know, what climate change has opened my eyes to is that you cannot do it unquestionably anymore. Um, you have to um, ask the question of, well, what else is my my investment dollar, my capital generating? Um, is it just return to me? What else comes out of that investment? Can I choose to invest in a better company that um, manages its, um, say, um, environmental footprint better? Um, uh, and can I choose to invest in uh, a company that treats its workers more ethically? Um, so I realize that, that, that the choices are out there. And um, contrary to um, uh, popular belief, taking into account these other, you know, what people used to call externalities or extra financial um, considerations, um, actually don't undermine the financial performance at all. If anything, it's a way to manage your investment risk even better because you're choosing the better performing companies, the companies that are more likely to be sustainable and to uh, outperform uh, other companies in the long run. Um, and so the last uh, previous decade has been about um, this journey of figuring out how to uh, manage um, a pool of, of uh, capital uh, in a responsible way, but also in a way that um, gives what I do meaning. Um, and at the end of the day, I think um, that's what we're all looking, I think, in going through life, is to find meaning in what we do, whether it's for a living or our passion or our talents, you know, as uh, um, these um, folks around me are, they all have their um, specific talents. Um, how do you find meaning in what you do? Um, and also in a way that is um, appropriate for the time that we live in. And I think climate change has to be the defining um, issue uh, for our time. Um, and I'll just add one, one more thing, which is um, that as I, I, I consider myself, you know, part of the baby boomer generation. Um, I think our, my generation grew up um, with, you know, the progress that you were talking about. Um, I'm sure when I was born, you know, um, refrigerators were a luxury. Now nobody lives without a refrigerator or an air conditioner or, you know, what have you. Um, and uh, yes, it was progress. You know, it made our lives significantly better, certainly much more comfortable and much more convenient, but um, we're paying the price now. And um, uh, um, my children will pay the price. Um, and I think that it was that realization um, that um, made me realize that um, uh, I cannot ignore it and I have to kind of integrate kind of this lens into everything that I do um, including investing so there you have it well, that's pretty moving you know the, the, the whole point of meaning meaning is like to my mind the, the ultimate intangible you know in terms of trying again to take something like financial return which is known to be to have to prove itself to be tangible, but base it on something as intangible as meaning. I think that's, again, part of this paradox, and uh, I didn't know it was 10 years, so that's, that's even more impressive. So Pearl Lamb, um, 
I wanted to ask to pick up a little bit on that with regard to the art market, because something that I have been intrigued by in, in studying a little bit about green finance is there's always a bit of resistance, even though what Annie said is very true. You don't sacrifice return, and there's a more and more evidence that the return is at least even and probably better. There's still resistance, like that, you know, well, how, how can you measure, you know, if, if, if the employees that um, are being better treated, uh, the, you know, how do you measure the success? How do you measure your impact if you invest in X versus Y? These things are not measurable. And so I was, I've always been looking for a sort of surrogate in terms of, well, how can you, we value a lot of other things, um, and we value a lot of other things very highly. It's not just the little Nautilus shell, but art, art, you know, pri varies in greatly in value, and it is in the eye of the beholder. So I want to ask you, Pearl, how do people value art from, you know, the heart, from the pocketbook? How does all that work out? I think art, um, the valuation, yeah, okay. Um, art, I, a piece of artwork, we always say to people, when you look at a piece of artwork, is always endorsed by several things. It's not about an auction market prices. It is about um, a curator academic support and also the collection in uh, the institution or and or any big name, I mean branded name, I mean big name collectors endorsement, and plus the fact that they have institutional support by having the solo exhibitions in and in and in museums and etc. So we call this as the CV of uh, the credentials of an artist. So with the credentials, you know how. How am I art market make and how people talk about the prices of an artwork is you have to have two elements coincide together. So you must have demands together with credentials. So it's not just um, in an auction when you bid up the price and you know if you just have a price, uh, price, high price of an artwork, that artwork is no longer artwork, it's a product because it doesn't have this institutional support. So <laughs> how do you want to relate this to, uh, to climate well, change? Only because <laughs> that, that intangible quality. People look, people look at the work of art and they make a determination that they're willing to pay for it because there's an emotional reaction. So I was trying to get at that yeah. emotional side as well. Oh, the emotion. I mean, if you talk about art, I mean, of course, I mean, that I think today, Honestly, in this art market, I think 99% people, when they buy art, um, they see it as an investment, which is very, which is completely, I think, very sad about it. Because I think when you buy a piece of artwork, you have to love it. You have, you have to feel it. You have to feel there's a soul. They, they inspired you. You buy a piece of artwork. But today, the honest truth in this art world is 99% of the collectors are looking at investment values. Or, and and it's, all, it's also because that people is not confident to take risk. So it's a parallel because, you know, parallel. it's a parallel. You have to, you know, we want the meaning of the artwork is what drives the drive to pay for it. And the meaning of investing uh, uh, with a more socially um, uh, astute optic uh, is, is what's driving green investment. And it's kind of sort of a leap, but just I'll indulge myself one minute. An interesting story of the city of Detroit, which was hitting bankruptcy. And the city fathers in the city of Detroit were planning to sell the art collection to raise cash. The city of Detroit has a, a world-class art museum. Um, uh, just an extraordinary collection. Nobody could price it. They called in all kinds of appraisers to try to get a, an, a, 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 a marketable price. No one could appraise it because it was so priceless. Then um, uh, it was all back and forth and finally some foundation stepped up and said, look, we will give you the amount of money you need to pay the pension plan debt so that the workers were taken care of. We will cover them. They'll have to take a haircut, but we'll cover them if you put the art collection in an irrevocable trust that can never be broken. So the art became collateral for the social benefit of the people in Detroit, 
and um, now the art is off the table. So, you know, what the foundations paid could be seen as, quote, the value of the art collection, except it's not also coming a cultural benefit. Close. And also the a cultural, cultural benefit. benefit. And also it's good for the city. Absolutely. The image for the city. Right. And it's helping the younger generation so they can have this um, opportunity to visit and to see the collection. I think what um, I think, Paolo, what you're saying is the carbon energy. We need to give values to the carbon energy. Exactly, exactly. Thank you. So Michael, Michael and I have known each other a long time. We found each other again in Hong Kong, and he's a very interesting man who sails all over the world, but he also is in the music world. And how did climate change come to your consciousness? I would like to know. Thank you. Um, well, I'm I'm a I'm a sensitive person. I'm just going back to the topic of the relationship between culture and climate change. And as I said to someone in the sort of drinks reception beforehand, I said, if we have no planet, we won't have any culture anyway. And I've, as I get older, I become more and more sensitive to playing the small part that I can to help preserve our planet and I'm get it's actually it's getting slightly neurotic I mean I even don't want to go to the supermarket anymore if I don't have my own carrier bag with me because it's not spending the 50p or whatever it is to buy the bag it's the very fact that I'm buying a plastic bag it makes me feel really really guilty um, I don't want to do it because I love wildlife and I find it a horror and I think all of these things are connected, climate change with what we are doing with plastics and how we are killing off so much of maritime life. Uh, so that makes me feel really bad. And so much so that the only uh, method of transportation that I've bought recently, not in Hong Kong but somewhere else, is because I don't have a car is a tricycle. I actually want to use my own energy to get around wow. and I can put my shopping bag, not a plastic one, in the back, you know. So, um, and I'm going to buy a boat which I want it to be, it's not a sailboat, but I want it to be solar powered. Um, so, really feel passionate about this and one of the things that you said just now, Pearl, which actually struck me maybe for the first time, is that people, many people, I suspect, don't necessarily care about what is on the painting that they're buying. They're just buying it as an investment. Yeah. No one does that in the music world. People come to concerts to be moved in some way. And of course, we do that all the time. Every week, we put on concerts. Because music is not an investment. No, it isn't. <laughs> but it's an investment of the soul. And so you can play Beethoven and you can play Mozart and Bach, etc. But you can also, and this is where we try and play a part, we don't ever intend to be lecturers to people and to tell them, you need to be thinking this, you need to be feeling that. But on the other hand, we try and be an imaginative. So I'll give you a couple of examples of things we've done. One, and your picture is brilliant photographs and the missing glacier. And by the way, I wish... I know there are books that are published, you know, Edinburgh, past and present, and it shows you the photographs taken, I don't know, 75 years ago or 100 years ago, and then the ones taken now, and you can compare and see how things change. I wish they did that, and maybe someone has, with the impact of climate change with glaciers, etc. So you can see 75 years ago, this is what the glacier was like on the top of Kilimanjaro a mountain I've climbed. And, you know, it was cold at the top, and there still is a glacier at the top, but it's much, much smaller than it used to be. So uh, past and present would be interesting from glaciers, etc. But we, we did a fascinating concert, which um, was inspired by a film from around 1950, 1952, Scott of the Antarctic. And the person who wrote the soundtrack to it was a very famous British composer called Rafe Vaughan Williams. And um, this film, as you probably know, is about the fact that Scott wanted to be the first human to get to the South Pole. And he did a reconnaissance trip, forgive me if I've got my years out by one or two years only, but maybe a reconnaissance trip around 1909. 
he didn't go to the South Pole, but he went to Antarctica just to see how it would work. And then he got wind of the fact that a Norwegian team was planning to get there before him. And so he didn't prepare properly. And in 1912, he went back with a huge expedition, including a very famous photographer, whose name escapes me just for the moment, who took photographs throughout this exhibition, which we projected on a screen while we were playing the soundtrack from this film, Scott of the Antarctic. And, you know, as, they, as the team got nearer and nearer the South Pole, people would stay behind. And only five people did the final leg. And they made it to the South Pole and they sort of got over the final hump. And imagine this, so many years of planning and the amount of money, and they're t cold, they're tired, they don't have enough rations because they didn't prepare properly. They go over the final hump to get to the South Pole. And what do they see? The Norwegian flag. And there's a very famous picture of these five people, and there were only five who got there, a picture of the five people. And this was before selfies. So the question is, how did they take the picture? And they had a camera, and one of them, who, even though his toes were frostbitten, he tied a piece of string around his toe, and the other end of the string to the camera, got into position, pulled his leg, they took the photograph, and on their way back that day, they all died. And Scott had been keeping a diary the whole time, writing of the experiences. And that was frozen for nine months along with the photographs, but it was all discovered the following spring. And it's incredibly preserved. And so uh, Rebecca Lee, who's the only Hong Kong lady, the only lady in the world, by the way, to have been to the Everest, the North Pole and the South Pole, she read extracts of the diary in Cantonese, and I read some in English, in between each movement of this symphony, with these photographs behind. And it was an incredible experience. But the, the benefit of it was that it has inspired other composers to write music that are linked to climate change. And there's another famous British composer called Peter Maxwell Davis, who unfortunately just passed away, who wrote a sequel to this. Um, and I mentioned um, Rebecca Lee. We also played the most famous piano concerto arguably in the world. The Butterfly Lovers for Violin and Orchestra is the most famous violin concerto because everyone in China knows it. Pearl River Concerto for Piano and Orchestra, the most famous Chinese piano concerto and therefore the most popular in the world. We played that, but in the talk before the concert, I got Rebecca Lee back who talked about the pollution in the river. And again, that was fantastic. And in China, as of a news report two days ago, China has the most polluted river in the world. But as I was preparing for this talk, I, I googled the impact of climate change on music or vice versa. And something popped up, which I think says it all in musical terms. So I'd like to conclude by playing, I think it's a history of climate change over 150 years in one minute. Wow. And it's a symphony that lasts one minute and it says it all.
That's it. I have nothing to add. Sorry. All right. Well, who does? That was very, uh, very, very moving and also fortuitous. You found it today in a perfect segue. I know we maybe have don't have very much time, but I'd like to just ask one follow up of each of you. What is next? What's next for you, Palani? Where are you taking your uh, sustainable sustainability initiative, Annie and um, Pearl? What do you see in art at the moment? Are there particular artists who are reacting to these things? Maybe we'll start with um, we'll start with you. Um. I've got a couple of uh, book projects that I'm working on, and one I've already done. Um, it's uh, it's a long work I've done uh, with Asian elephants. Um, so we've been to 15 uh, countries, and it asks the question that as Asians, oh. <laughs> should we dance? Yes, it's time to go. <laughs> no, it's um, um, kind of long story short. It's it asks the question as Asians whether we love these animals or we hate them. You know, we. We treat them in the most appalling way one minute and then we, we, uh, we pray to them and, and name our kids after them. So it's a, it's a project that looks at elephants and where elephants, Asian elephants, whether we deserve to have them, basically. And uh, the other one is about, about the horses. So. And I would love to have some music with it one day. I mean, I'm just inspired. I'm, I've got your card. <laughs> Great. Annie, where are you going next? Um, so I met someone uh, uh, a few days ago, and um, he said um, that social advancement um, and human happiness uh, happen at the intersection of giving, getting, and creating. I really like that. Um, so uh, uh, one of the things that we're creating uh, in some way is something called the Sustainable Finance Initiative. Um, it is a, um, hopefully, um, eventually will be a um, fully fledged uh, nonprofit platform to promote um, the whole ecosystem around sustainable finance uh, in Hong Kong. And anybody who's remotely interested in that, uh, please visit our website and let us know and we will put you on our list. And then maybe you'll collaborate with Pearl Lam with an art show. <laughs> I think it is important for you all to know that sustainability, this word, has been in the art and design world since and since the millennial. And especially in design and architecture, I don't know whether people know about it, is during the World Expo in China in 2010. It, it, one of the um, objectives in that um, well exposed is sustainability. So every design, every architecture, it needs to reflect sustainability. So it, is, it's, it, it has been a really big word in my world. So when uh, parlors talk about it, I mean, it's, it's, it's a natural thing for us. So artists, are, a lot of artists, when we talk about conceptual art, many of these artists, they are talking about urban development. And what is about urban development? It's about climate. It's about what is the impact onto us. So I think this, this whole, I mean, for me, sustainability, when we talk about design, architecture, is a bit passe. And so people today are actually taking different um, approach to address and to support sustainability is a must. And for art-wise, for, and for artists, there's many, many artworks. We are talking about social responsibilities, talking about urban development. And um, the underlying thing is, is this is about, I mean, is a reaction about climate change. So we don't openly, bluntly discuss about it, but it's all the underlying meaning. And that's what the world, I mean, that's what my world is going through. Michael, what's next? I know you have a very interesting program next weekend. Well, first of all, the name of the photographer on the Antarctic expedition was Herbert Ponting. That's worth, it's worth Googling him and just checking out the photos. They are unbelievable. Uh, secondly, I, I just wanted to throw in that, you know, with, you know, 60 years ago, when the CD did not exist and it, you didn't have the ability to transmit music around the world the way you can now digitally in such high, high cl uh, quality. You know, then there was legitimacy, I would say, to orchestras, many orchestras flying all over the world, polluting the atmosphere by so doing. And I'm sort of beginning to think, 
do we need to fly around the world? I mean, there are orchestras in most cities. Why do we all get on planes and fly to each other's cities? Imagine what we're cont contributing badly to the atmosphere. So I don't like that. Hmm. So I'm well, going to think project. about that. There's a project. Um, but this isn't meant to be a sales pitch, but we do have a concert next week <laughs> <laughs> called, called Songs of the Earth. And it's actually a fascinating program because... Two composers, Gustav Mahler, first of all, wrote a piece, a very famous piece called Das Lied von der Erde, The Song of the Earth. He was Austrian, but it's inspired by Chinese poems. And these Chinese poems are about love and celebrating life, but half of them are about the joy of the earth and just being on it and part of it. I wish I could link it more closely to climate change, but I can't. And then there's a companion piece with this famous piece by Mahler by a Chinese composer, which is also inspired by the same poetry. And that is also called The Song of the Earth. So we've called it The Songs of the Earth. So um, who knows, I'm, I can probably arrange some complimentary tickets for those <laughs> interested in coming. So please feel free to do so. That's next Friday and Saturday, next week, 8 p.m., Cultural Center. Thank you. <laughs> there you go. Perfect ending. Thank you all very much. Thank you for coming. Thank you, the wonderful panel. Thank you for bringing that symphony. We have to make use of that many, many ways. So thank you again. And, and really, I appreciate all that you, uh, the time you spent with us tonight. Thanks again.